Hello everyone. Welcome to the season finale of Bios and Bookmarks, season six, At Home the Green Remains, powered by the NGC Bocas Lit Fest. I can't believe our season has already wound to a close, but not before we feature our final amazing guest of the season, Amanda Smith, with her new novel, Fortune. Set in the oil fields of Trinidad and Tobago in a pioneering age, Fortune explores a corridor of TNT's history that is quite underdeveloped in our fiction. We are delighted to have Amanda with us today, and also delighted that she'll be joined by our special guest host, Ira Mathur. Ira is an Indian born, multimedia, Trinidad based journalist and Trinidad Guardian columnist. She's a recipient of nine regional awards for excellence in journalism. Ira is a 2018 second prize winner of the Caribbean-based Small Axe Literary Competition for Short Fiction. And we're also excited that her debut memoir, Love the Dark Days, is forthcoming from People Tree Press in 2022. Ira is currently serving as the president of the Media Association of Trinidad and Tobago. As all of you know who've been with us on this Bios and Bookmarks journey, this season has been consecrated to the environment, specifically to the rich and enduring relationship Caribbean writers have with our regional ecology, what we can learn from it, how we have preserved it, how we can do a better job. Fortune is a novel so well suited to address these concerns, and I'm really excited for the conversation Ira and Amanda are about to have. So without further ado, pull up your best chair, pour yourself your favorite seasonal drink, and enjoy the conversation. To bios and bookmarks. I'm just very, very honored and I feel like I'm trying to fill extremely big shoes when I try to do Shivani's job because she really does do it best. However, I'm thrilled to be here with my friend and a writer that, who I admire immeasurably, uh, my guest Amanda Smith. And um, as Shivani said, we'd be speaking of her third novel, Fortune, based on the tragic dome fire in Trinidad in 1928. And of course, it's published by People Tree Press. For those who, of you who may not be completely familiar with Amanda Smith, here's something about her. Um, Amanda Smith is an Irish Trinidadian and an author of three novels. Her first novel, Black Rock, won the pre premiere and it was nominated for an NAACP award. It was shortlisted for the McKittrick Prize and selected as an Oprah Winfrey summer read. Actually, that's when I first encountered Amanda. Black Rock was chosen as one of Waterstone's new voices and translated into five languages. Her second novel, A Kind of Eden, set in contemporary Trinidad, was published in 2013 and optioned as a TV series. Um, her fiction and poetry have appeared in New Writing, London Magazine, The Times Literary Supplement, Harvard Review, and broadcast on BBC Radio 4. Amanda teaches creative writing at Arvon Skyros, Greece, and Coventry University. She lives in Leamington Spa with her husband and lovely daughter, Amelie. Uh, Fortune is the work of a novelist uh, much at the height of her powers 
And uh, as I wrote uh, in my review in the Trinidad Guardian, you remain drenched in the story long after you put it down. Um, but before Amanda reads from the book, and let me just uh, tell you a little bit more about it, and let's have a look at what the reviewers are saying. The UK Guardian compared Smith's writing with Rees. Uh, the review said of Fortune, a magnificently absorbing tale of passion, greed, and the misplaced energies that caused environmental and personal ruin. The Irish Times, through her character, burn with passion, greed, desperation, the dreamlike quality of Smith's prose gives them the feel of sleepwalkers blindly drawn to their doom. That inescapable sense of fate slowly builds throughout the novel, giving this brilliant reimagining of actual event events, the dome fire of 1928 in which 20, 17 people were killed, the momentum and power of a Greek tragedy. Monique Roffey, uh, who won this year's Costa, said that it was meticulously plotted, written in sentences of polished platinum. And Kai Miller's blurb on Fortune says, a writer has to be at the heights of her power to slip so comfortably and so beautifully into the skin of history and let it breathe like this. Trinidad is at crossroads, Coco is literally dying, oil is about to change everything. And Smith has gathered a wonderful cast of characters to meet at this crossroad and everyone's fortune is at stake. This is Smith's best novel to date. Now, let me very quickly tell you a little bit about the novel before Amanda reads. It is Trinidad of the 1920s, oil spurts. The first plane flies to Venezuela, cinema arrives, gingerbread houses have sprung up. The Cadbury brothers in England have stopped importing cocoa. Poverty is on the rise and there are water riots. And it begins with Eddie Wade, a charismatic and ambitious freshwater Yankee with experience in oil in the US, persuading Sonny Chatterjee, a flailing farmer whose ancestral land is floating in oil to allow him to drill there. Initially reluctant, Eddie breaks down Sonny over a series of visits, mainly because Sonny's wife, Sita, is unhappy about their reduced circumstances due to falling cocoa prices. After one of his visits to Sonny's estate, Eddie's truck breaks down and Taito Fernandez, a local businessman, stops, gives Eddie a lift into town and over time offers to invest in Eddie's drill on Sonny's land. He introduces Eddie to his wife, Aunt Ada. Well, Taito is generous and expansive, but also tormented to the edge of suicide after having unwittingly sanctioned the murder of his ex fiancees new lover. Taito's beautiful and decades younger wife, Ada, who he adores and guards watchfully, is his Achilles heel. Achilles heel. Under Taito's controlling eye, Ada, impulsive and stifled in Trinidad, is susceptible to Eddie's considerable charms and Taito is painfully aware of this. I don't want to give away all of it, but the rest is inevitability, a tale beautifully told of love, lust, greed, and betrayal, overreaching and destiny. And so on that note, it's my pleasure to ask Amanda to read from her novel, Fortune. Thank you, Ira. Um, I'm going to read from the point at which Tito has just met Eddie at the beginning of the book, and we do a flashback to earlier that same morning when he took a journey that Eddie knows nothing about. <clears throat> that same Sunday morning, after he'd said goodbye to Ada and Flora, he had driven out of town towards the east, past the turning to St. Joseph, where he told Ada he had urgent business. He'd made his way along the empty road, feeling wretched, as the land rushed by, the cane fields and rice fields and the beautiful hills with their black scars and the lilac sky above them, he wondered how he was going to dig himself out of the hole he was in. He had lost half of the family fortune in New York. He had more than $50,000 saved in a high interest account in the Bank of the United States, which according to the press was preparing to announce its closure. The Hoover administration and the Federal Reserve were doing nothing to slow the rate of bank failures all over America, and Alfie Mendez, his accountant, had warned Tito not to invest any more. He'd never foreseen the fall of Caldwell. How could he? But worse, 
He had taken a loan against his business to invest in a bank in Tennessee that had collapsed last week. The family stores were in jeopardy. He couldn't face telling Ada. Alfie told him he'd been lucky. There were men in New York who'd lost everything in one afternoon, hurling themselves from the tops of buildings. But what do I tell Ada? Tell her the truth. Talk to her. She'll be furious. Well, not as furious as if she hears it from someone else. While Tito drove, while Tito, while Tito drove along the road lined with coconut trees, their branches tossing like hair in the wind, he wondered if he might have done better elsewhere. England, America, Europe, perhaps. But with a lump in his throat, he thought of how much he loved this island. He could never have lived anywhere else. He remembered with some sadness how at five years old, he'd cried when he saw the skin of a tiger stretched out on the wooden floor of a house in Surrey, England. <clears throat> the lady of the house had asked, are you crying because of the tiger? Yes, he said, not because it was dead, be because it looked like a map of Trinidad. She took pity on him, went to the library, pulled down an atlas, and she found the page featuring the British West Indies, the islands, were scattered there in pastels against the blue of the sea. She said, I see what you mean, a tiger skin. Be glad that you love your country so. As he'd headed towards Manzanilla, Tito imagined himself driving along the tiger's belly. And as he felt the hot breeze blowing through the window, he remembered how in England, he'd never felt warm. Sorry, I think I'm getting some disturbance here from my um from my Apple, I'm not sure if it's my Apple Watch. Uh, no matter how many vests and sweaters he wore and how he positioned himself by the open fire in the great hall, his bones were always trembling. He traded baths with other boys so he could soak in hot water three or four times a week. He lost weight, school meals made him sick. He survived on tins of mandarin oranges, slurps of condensed milk, Every morning, longing for the crabby hand of his mother's writing, he looked for letters from home, watched for a coral stamp showing blue basin and an airmail sticker. He waited for summer to come, not realising his mother had other plans for him, seven years at the Royal College of Surgeons in Dublin. Tito hadn't cared for anatomical lectures, the minute of the human body and its illnesses. Clinical investigations and post-mortems held no interest for him. He learned that to tug off the top of someone's skull, you needed a bone saw and some force. Tearing through the thin layers of tissue, covering through the muscles and internal organs wasn't always easy. He had learned how to make a buttonhole in the skin to hook your finger through it and peel it away. The skin on the back peels beautifully, his lecturer said, because of glutinous fat beneath the surface. Tito was mostly bored, his interest held only by the cardiology lectures. He found himself enthralled by the heart and its workings. It's 100,000 beats a day, the effortless pumping of blood around the body. He liked the idea of chambers, like rooms in a house, and the blood's journey through capillaries and arteries, running through veins and rivers, like rivers and streams and roads and tracks. The heart was the centre of man, where his soul's fire burned. It needed to be tended. If its pathways were stretched and laid out, they would travel the earth twice, the enormous world of the heart. He'd asked his lecturer, was it possible the heart could actually be broken? Why, yes, of course. Heartbreak could inflict damage like the blow of an axe. The heart could become diseased, rotten, an overworked thing of hardened muscle, a rock. He'd felt one in his hands, the enlarged grey heart of a woman brought from the psychiatric unit who killed herself after more than 50 attempts. Finally, when he'd sailed home to Trinidad, his studies cut short by a bronchial infection in an appalling winter when Dublin's little houses on the outskirts vanished beneath drifts of snow. Tito was 25 years old. As the steamer approached the dragon's mouth, he watched the sea narrow itself between four islands, like stepping stones along the 12 mile passage. And when he saw the tall black and copper cliffs and the young palms along them blowing in the warm breeze, he felt his heart burst open. At Scotland Bay, the sea was tourmaline and it seemed to him the pointed hills were awash with gold and he began to cry with joy. His mother and father met him at the airport, his father in his familiar white suit, his mother as tidy and neat as a new doll. At once, he saw the disappointment in his mother's face and he knew that he'd failed her. 
Long before they reached home, she was asking, what was he going to do? If he thought he could come home and lie around the place, he could think again. It had been, Tito believed, the right time to come back. Recent trouble in Port of Spain over the installation of proposed water meters had caused unrest. Protesters had gathered outside the Red House and pelted it with stones, and rioters poured inside and set fire to stacks of paper. The governor had to be rushed to safety at police headquarters. A young woman, Eva Cavallo, was shot at point-blank range by a policeman who was said to be her estranged lover, while 12-year-old Eliza Bunting was bayoneted through the chest. Victor, Victor Fernandez had been caught up in this fray on his way home. He was left badly shaken. A deep gashed his head from a broken bottle. Tito told himself, now more than ever, his family needed him. Victor Fernandez gave his son an apron and set him to work in the store. Fernandez Bazaar was 600 square feet with floor to ceiling windows, a room at the back where coca growers brought beans in exchange for goods. Tito was assigned to the storeroom upstairs to count stock. He took it upon himself to thoroughly clean the room, reorganize stock in a way that made it possible to see their quantities at once. He grouped goods by their type rather than their use. He labelled every shelf and noted every item. He quickly understood how inefficient inventory led to financial loss and how time spent looking for this or that was wasted time. All unusable items, out of date or broken, were removed. Seasonal decorations were taken away and stored off site. Victor Fernandez was astonished by his son's initiative. Tito was popular with customers, his dark eyes warm and brown as brandy. He'd say, is there anything else I could do for you? Have a wonderful day. Do come back and see us soon. He remembered names. Yes, Mrs. Tibbetts. I, can I put your bags behind the counter while you carry on shopping? Hello, Mrs. Robinson, and how is your son today? Red suits you very well, Mrs. Davies. He persuaded his father to offer refreshments to thirsty shoppers. We must make them feel cared for, he said. Water the plants and watch them grow. He had filed collated and chased ledgers, often until late at night. In his lunch hour, he visited other department stores for ideas or scoured the financial pages of the Daily Star. He encouraged his father to discount goods and enable customers to purchase on high interest instalment plans. In those early days, Victor Fernandez imported goods from Madeira, onions, the most succulent and nutritious beans, peas, garlic, wine, lace, tiles, biscuits. Tito persuaded his father to broaden their range. Why not bring in clothes or sell shoes? The same ladies who shop for cookies needed to buy shoes and dresses and toys for their kids. Don't send them to Batter or Miller's. Could his father see how Port of Spain was changing? Tito found a supplier of fine leather ladies and gent shoes in New York. He told his father, the secret was they must fit the shoe to the foot, not the foot, foot to the shoe. He sought out fabrics through an old school friend in England whose father and mother now lived in Bandra, Bombay. With their help, he imported silks and linens, silver and brass ornaments. Spices and herbs came from Europe along with champagne and fine wines. He brought ice machines into the city to sell to restaurants and bars. A stainless steel industrial pasta machine with Canadian flour. He made the best spaghetti in Trinidad. He set up a five-star hotel right there in Marine Square. Now there was scarcely any important city in the world that Fernandez and co. did not import goods from. Tito located a large warehouse on the west coast, on the west of Port of Spain and refurbished the stockroom to make a second shop floor and installed a lift. His father complained when he saw the accounts. They were spending money as fast as it was coming in. But for all his complaining, it seemed to Tito, his father's protestations were half-hearted. The store was the busiest in Frederick Street and new sign went up, Fernandez and Co, something for everyone. In the evenings on his way home, Tito drove around the savannah, looking out at the lights, and it seemed the grassland was a lake and he could almost imagine boats upon it. He glanced at the hills behind, dense with trees and bush, and he felt a rightness about his life, as if where he had meant to go was exactly where he'd been. And it often came upon him like a fact, as it did now, that this was the country where he would live and where he would die, this dense green land with its woodland and rivers and mountains and sprawling beaches was his home.
That Sunday morning, after driving for more than two hours, Tito had pulled into the grassy lay-by, then swerved into a narrow trail that he knew took him to the beach. He saw the tide was out and the sand was pale as flour. There was no one there. It wasn't the time of year for holiday makers, which was just as well. He parked in the shade of an almond tree, turned off the engine and found a driftwood log to sit on. He looked out at the foamy frills on the, water, on the waves, stared far, far out where the sea met the sky and found it difficult to see a separation between the two, blue and more blue. The sun was not yet high. He loosened his tie, undid the top button of his shirt and took a deep breath. He felt a little shudder as his, in his body as if he was letting go of something. There was a slight breeze and he could smell the sea's salty breath. He thought about Flora, his daughter, and Ada, his wife, and he felt his heart lift with love for them. They were a part of his heart walking around in the world. He loved them more than anything. He knew he had a tendency for heaviness and Ada could always raise his spirits, but these days he couldn't find it in himself to make love to her. She deserved better. She deserved more. He thought of the woman he'd almost married before Ada. She came to him like a photograph. Matilda Mendonca, daughter of a friend of his father's, a devoted Catholic. She had jilted him two weeks before their wedding for Carlos Ethvedo, a younger man, an overseer on a sugar estate. He'd been beside himself. Oops. Hang on a sec, I'm just getting some disturbance here. Um, <clears throat> She jilted him two weeks before their wedding for Carlos Espedo, a younger man, an overseer on a sugar estate. He'd been beside himself. He'd known the cost of this emotional pain to the heart, a high risk of arterial fibrillation, erratic blood flow leading to an early and often sudden death. For a year, Tito kept the wedding cake in an icebox and cut himself a slice every day to eat with his afternoon coffee. Some days he ate two wedges of, of the fruity layered cake cake encrusted with marzipan and a delicious citrus icing. Eating the cake was a comfort. This is how he started putting on weight. It was because of Matilda and Carlos. Over that year, he convinced himself that Matilda and Carlos had ruined his life forever. His brother told him he should do something, teach Carlos a little lesson and rough him up. It would make him feel better, help to quell the pain. Raoul knew people who could help. Why should you suffer, he said. Let them suffer instead. Eventually, Tito gave Raoul $500 and told him to take care of it. Six weeks later, Carlos was found beaten to death outside a rum shop on the road to Dominica, on the road to Russo, Dominica. Then he'd met Ada at the country club years old ball, old years ball, grown up and dazzling, dressed as the queen of diamonds. He had known her as a child, but now she was different. He was struck by her brightness, her humor, all the 52 moles he counted on her creamy skin. He courted her over a period of months. She swore to him that she would honour and cherish him. He knew he could trust her. His beloved Ada, to the beach, to the trees, to the vast sky, Tito had spoken her name aloud. Ada, Ada. For the first time since his father died, Tito allowed himself to cry, big heaving sobs from his guts. He wondered at that moment if his financial loss was punishment from God for what he'd done to Carlos. Yes. Perhaps God was punishing him. He deserved it. He deserved to suffer. This thought made him cry more. By then, the sun was high, the sea a hard silver strip. He could fill the pocket, his pockets with stones and walk out into the water, swim as far as he could. He would soon tire, hope for a riptide to carry him out. The Atlantic was agitated at this time of year. It would quickly pull him down. What was he waiting for? He deserved to die. He killed a man not with his own hands, but by his own might. Then he saw something. At first he couldn't figure it out. A buffalo? A cow? No, this was something else. A horse, as pale as a ghost, was standing at the water's edge, dipping its head. It was unusual to see a horse here on the beach. Still for a moment, it started to walk in his direction. Its mane was white, the pale legs lanky and young, a palomino, a palomino at Manzanilla. The horse had raised its nose as if smelling something in the air, smelling him perhaps. Tito had always loved horses. He remembered from school. 
The air of heaven is that which blows between a horse's ears. He walked towards it, sand falling over his, his leather shoes, the sun burning his watery eyes. Come, he said through his tears, and he put out his hand. The horse approached him, moving quicker now, swishing its tail of white ribbons, flicking its long mane, its hoofs quiet and quick on the soft beach. It stopped in front of him, shoved its soggy nose into his palm, and he ran his fingers along its golden forehead, stroked the curve of cheek. Its dark eyes were shiny, and they seemed to hold the world inside them. Had it escaped from a nearby farm? To whom did it belong? It was well looked after. He remembered peppermints in his cotton jacket, and the horse crunched through them. You like that? You like sweets, eh? After a few minutes, the horse glanced back to something further down the bay. Then it flipped its head and turned from him. Tito watched it trot along the beach until it became small. Just before it disappeared into the hazy light, it glanced back at him and carried on. He felt something inside him shift. What was the horse doing here? Had it come to tell him something? He wondered for a moment if it was real. A vision? A symbol of hope? He looked up to the sky. God, if this is a sign, then help me climb out of the disaster I've made for myself. He got back in his car and started for home. His mind strangely clear and blank as a fresh sheet of paper. He drove through the village of Mayara and through the streets of Princess Town and back along the southern main road towards Port of Spain. About an hour later, he saw a truck broken down on the side of the road next to Saman Tree. Further along the same road, a man was walking alone. That man was Eddie Wade. Thank you. Can't hear you, actually, Ira. You can't hear. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, I can now. <laughs> okay. So um, sorry, that was is, a bit long. No, it was wonderful. Every bit of it was wonderful, and it was a love letter to Trinidad, starting with uh, just the shape of the tiger. You know, you know, when you love somebody or you love something so much, you see them everywhere, and even that shape of Trinidad in the dead tiger. You know, that's where he was. His head was in Trinidad. And then yeah. when you come back and how beautifully you put it, you know, you, you set Trinidad in the 20s. You know, you um, you kind of involve so many things all at once, the, the human heart, the, the passions. And yet what's actually happening uh, in Trinidad at the time. So it's also it's very situated in the news. It's situated in the 1920s. And somehow it's also very close to the heart. So here's something I want to ask you. Is this a love letter to Trinidad, as you have said before? And how do you combine a love letter to Trinidad with such a dramatic historical ex explosion in oil? Okay. I mean, I think um, it is a love, I mean, I think it is a love letter to Trinidad in a way. And I loved writing all those moments about the land or that that lots and lots of description having to really think about it having to really imagine that time in history um it was not it was a joy to do it you know you know me well and you know how i feel about trinidad so it it was a it was a wonderful way to dig in and really explore that time um i think you know in a way when i've been i've been trying to sort of um boil down you know what if I had to think about what fortune is really about it, it for me it's about overreaching in a way um, I think the idea that everybody is you know people seem to want more people you know why do we never give up people say um, it was, I remember there's a story that I read some years ago by Richard Ford that stayed with me where the pr protagonist is caught in a love affair and he's plagued by this question handed down to him from his father who says, is this it for you? Is this it? Is this the woman for you? Is this the life you want? Is this, is this what you have dreamed of? And you know, the, all the, the characters in this 
are kind of asking that and Eddie triggers them into asking that question of themselves. So if they if they accept what they have, does that mean a kind of defeat, you know, or is there something that they should always be reaching for? And that I think when I started to really look at what was underneath all of that, um, the, the the, the, the roots of fortune, it, it, that seemed to be the thing that was driving, I think, a lot of the, the characters and then set in the landscape of, of Trinidad, which is a place that I come and, and leave. I visit and I leave. I don't belong to it. And yet I'd love to belong to it. I feel a connection with it. And then this land is a kind of canvas on which they, they play out their dramas. Um, and in all of that, the, the, um, the, the earth couldn't care less, you know, they do their thing. So Trinidad is a, a place where Ada feels trapped. It's a place when I've lived there, chunks of time where I've also felt trapped. It's a place where Eddie sees it as an opportunity to fill his pockets. He thinks he can be somebody there in America. You know, he's a nobody, but in Trinidad he can, he can be a somebody. Um, and then we have, you know, uh, Sonny Chatterjee, who has a kind of guilty loyalty to his father's land and a love for it, but he's also willing to sell out too, you know? So that's a big answer to uh, to your question, sorry. No, I mean, you know, it, 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 it needs a big answer. To many of us, you know, we're familiar with, with Trinidad's history, and this is something that doesn't immediately crop up when one thinks of our history. It's based during the, the Roaring Twenties um, on a former cocoa estate in, in Separia. Um, what prompted you to dig up and literally write about this explosion, and, and how close have you kept to the original? I think initially I just wanted to write about an explosion. I just had this idea that I wanted to write about, um, and I, it was an idea that came from the the London bombings, you know, in two thousand and five. Those, you know, terrible, um, it's a terrible incident that I, you know, I was at the time I was in Trinidad, and I was on. I would have been on one of those trains because I used to take that route every day, and I thought of the people who missed the train, those who were late. Um, and it made me think about whether our lives are forecasted or plotted, whether they're you know, these random things that happen to us that seem like fate, like the finger of God. And then my, I spoke to my mum who said, you know, if you want to write about an explosion, go to the dome, go and look at that story. So this was back in 2016. And I was at Bocas that, that year and while I was checking my bags at security, I looked up and I saw um, Angelo, um, you know, the historian Bissasa. Angelo Bissasa Singh. Yeah. And, um, and I'd heard about him. And I looked at him and I said, do you think you could, do you know about the dome? Could you tell me about the dome? Is that something that you could maybe help me with? And his eyes were bright like stars, you know, and he said, come to my house and I will take you there myself and I did I went I went with him um, to the original site and the more I started drilling down you know to use that metaphor the more the more that I started drilling down into the the story the more enchanted I, I was you know and then I read the um, wonderful novel by Isolt Bridges the Creole magic and I read uh, Father de Verti's, um you know, essay about the the dome fire. Um, so it was an exciting, it was a kind of exciting time to start asking people questions. I started talking to oil men, finding out about early days of, um, you know, how the corporations, you know, anyway, I just started digging in more and more and I got excited about it and hearing very personal stories, um, you know, somebody told me that they had Eddie Wade's watch, you know, when I, which was, wow. you know, the idea that his watch was somewhere around that he nearly married their aunt. That was Sharon Miller, actually. Um, so there were, there were lots of coincidences that seemed to lead me further and further. And the further I went, the more excited I got about the whole thing. Um, and, and I, I kind of understood this, had more of an understanding rather of this immense tragedy, um, 
of you know all these lives lost at that time um speaking of drilling down um although we have been speaking of the human heart and we have been speaking of human desires you speak you seem to have really grasped that very technical aspect of how the early oil drills worked in the 1920s and that's quite something to me i mean i'm assuming you don't have a degree in engineering um <laughs> i know but it you seem to have somehow got all the technicalities of it and uh, translated it so well into layman's language could you tell us a little bit more about the process of researching how how oil was drilled in those days yeah i mean it was a fascinating time in history so um you know when i started to again you know, looking more closely at what was happening in America, in Texas. Um, there was a, you know, in the town of Beaumont, for in instance, I, you know, that it tripled within three months at the time of this early oil exploration, because people knew that this was going to be a huge thing. There were like, you know, 1500 oil companies had been created in like no time at all. Um, and I started to read around that. I started reading technical books and, uh, <laughs> I mean, I became quite obsessed. I had diagrams on my wall. I was, I got very um, excited by these technical terms like um, the diamond bit, you know, the derrick floor, the blowout preventer, roughnecks, roustabouts. You know, it was, for me, I loved all those names, the town Corsicana. I use that word, you know, in the, in Eddie's um, backstory, this place called Corsicana, which I, I love the sound of the name, the big gusher, spindle top. And then this idea that people were um, dowsing for oil so that they go out, you know, with their dowsing sticks and they might come across, you know, water, but they would be praying for it and, you know, doing these, you know, kind of big um, journeys, uh, you know, into the wilderness looking for this possibility of a gusher. Um, and digging down and sometimes they'd find it you know sort of 70 foot which was incredible so what i did was i read as much as i could i tried to understand it i stopped myself from going to texas to go to the oil museum where i could see a kind of big you know rotary drill in action and then i tried to forget it and so all my favorite words and the little anecdotes that I'd picked up here and there, I took those and then I fed them into the story at various points. But I didn't want it to be too dry. I didn't want it, you know, to be somebody to get bored and bogged down with detail. So by forgetting it, there's, I'm sure there are inaccuracies there because I would have um, read it and then, you know, just written a kind of rough hand. Um, but I thought it doesn't matter. It's better to do that than to, you know, well, I was I was very in, <clears throat> I was personally very impressed. Um, one question that comes out of this is, I think, something that we all think of, right? It's a kind of exploitation of the land. Uh, it's yeah. an exploitation of Trinidad, and in some sense, when you think of multinationals, you think of um, even up to today. You know, there's so much noise around oil and gas companies, and what does Trinidad get out of it? And you know, uh, should we have a bigger share of our own pie? So there's a sense of pillaging uh, alongside with a wonderful feel that you have of the landscape itself. So they are side by side. You see the lushness. It's almost like a, it is like a, a kind of Eden, like the, the title of one of your other books, because there's green mm. and, you know, the trees are so beautifully, the trees, the earth, the land, and people's relationship to it is so beautifully, mm -hmm. um, you know, portrayed. So would you say that in some sense that you were consciously also speaking of the first, the early exploitation of oil in Trinidad and, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know that I did it so consciously i didn't set out to write something that was going to explore you know kind of explore that particularly but i i mean what i was really struck you know when i was early in the early researching days when i saw how corporations you know came in offering offering a little bit of money you know to do exploratory work on the land and some of those indian landowners who were immigrants you know they'd been they'd come from india and they'd been offered a piece of land to stay in trinidad 
and the corporations didn't give a damn you know they'd strip the land of the trees and the vegetation and when they didn't find anything they gave it back so the land was kind of useless for years and that's what that's what happened with um sunny chatterjee you know that's what i wanted to show with him i mean we see it now you know in the same thing and how it you know oil has a, it has a serious impact on our on our land and our marine ecosystems we've I mean, all that was that was quite interesting, but it wasn't it wasn't something that I consciously set out to do. But but it was it was there. It was there underneath, you know, yes. in the in the writing. And in a sense, it does show us the universality of how of greed, of colonialism, of how mm -hmm. easy it is to exploit uh, smaller countries without the resources to do it themselves. You know, the idea of this guy who lived mm -hmm. in America coming here, you know, getting all mm -hmm. that investment which the locals couldn't, and just doing his thing. Um, I I think we have. Um, a couple of questions. I mean, I'd love to talk to you all afternoon, which is something I always love. But uh, I, I thought we, we could start with some of the questions. We've got a really interesting question from Teresa White. Um, and she's asking, what drew you to this uh, story? And how much do you personally feel the pull of Trinidad? How much do you personally feel that love letter? Mm, good question. Um, you know, I, I in my own, you know, all my life, I've loved Trinidad. I've spent, you know, lots of chunks of time there. My mother is there. My my family, you know, members of my family is, are there, and it feels like home. It, you know, going back feels like home. There feel there's a kind of rightness about being there, and I think when I've checked with myself, you know, why am I writing? Why am I drawn to write about Trinidad in this way? It's, it's a conversation I've had with Monique. You know, she did, she's also pulled to write about Trinidad. And maybe we, you know, maybe for me anyway, I have, you know, lots of unanswered questions. It's it's a place that, you know, is mysterious to me that I want to understand. It's, it's a, it's a powerful, it's a powerful draw for me. It, it, makes me feel a lot it makes me the, the just the, the landscape alone you know evokes all kinds of feelings of belonging and alienation you know it's a it, it's a big powerful mysterious mm. place in my in my consciousness that i think I'll, i can continually mine it you know i could go on and on i think keep wanting to write about it so yeah and I think many people who come here, it's like, you know, they, they have that cascadu and suddenly it, there's that Trinidad magic. You can love it or hate it. You can never be indifferent. Mm. You can never really understand it. And that's really, really, you know, apparent in your writing. Um, I want to ask a question from Naomi uh, J. And she's saying, Amanda, what do you think makes Fortune different from the novels you've written before? And did you yourself feel different while writing it? Good question, Naomi. Um, yeah, I think Black Rock was written from the first person, so that was that was very different. Trying to imagine myself in a particular place and time, um, a kind of Eden felt very much like a, you know, a sort of outsider's point of view written in th close third person, and this was different in that. I wanted to write about many kind of many different points of view and it and you know initially it it began with 70 i wanted to write 17 voices wow <laughs> that's which great song. really yeah which um because it i felt as though all those all those voices mattered you know all those people who died they all mattered and i wanted i wanted all of them to tell the story very differently so that they all could give their version of the story um, and then I abandoned that idea. But I think that, I think what made this so different from the others was it's a, you know I had to be quite um, aware and conscious of the real story so that I was I was using that to lean on but not totally to you know I wasn't writing this isn't it's a piece of fiction it's not non-fiction so I was using it as a kind of washing line in a way on which I pinned my characters. And then I invented around that. So to use a real life situation, which Blackrock had some of that, this was a really definite 
time in history that mattered. So I had to be conscious of it. And and also, you know, the, there was a lot of technical detail, as we just discussed, you know, to get around. I think if I'd realized just how much I had to do, I might not have done it. <laughs> you know, I might have said, forget that, you know, so. I'm glad I you think, didn't do in, that. But in that way, it was it was quite, in terms of research, that that was a lot of it's a lot of work. So. There's a real sense here of you coming into your own, though, uh, kind of taking your novel and your writing to up to another step, and also deepening your relationship both with the with the craft of writing as well as Trinidad. So there's that depth, um, and it does show. You know, it really does show. Uh, is there one particular thing that you can point to for that? point at <laughs> yeah I mean I uh, I think maybe I think uh, in a way I poured so much of everything that I know into these characters I think I you know if I think about Black Rock that was a very it was one young woman's perspective you know kind of even it was a, a rather you know unlikable um protagonist a really couldn't bear him actually, and and I, you know, wrote him as well as I could. But with this, I feel like I had different vehicles, you know, in which I could kind of pour myself and kind of give everything I had, you know. So it's filled with that. I feel like I filled them up, you know. I filled up the story. It was full of things. It was full of a lot of who I am, you know. And you um, certainly did. I mean, that brain of yours, Amanda, it's full. I mean, it's so full. <laughs> it comes out. It really comes out in the landscape, in the story, in the heart. And yeah. the way you beautifully yeah. crafted it, you somehow managed to take all of this, you know, being human, the range of being human, the range of the Trinidad's complexity and a very particular point in history and putting mm. it all together. I'm going to now go to a couple more questions because I think Andre has a couple of questions and I don't want to rob him of that. So here's a question from Andre Bagu. He's saying, in terms of your writing process, can you tell us about the role of revising and editing? Um, and he's also asking, what was it like working with Jeremy Pointing of People Tree? <laughs> okay, how long have you got? The, you <laughs> I know, want the to writing. <laughs> You do know, you do know what it's like to work with Jeremy. Um, well, this this novel began with, as I said, 17 points of view, which was just way too much to kind of get a handle on. And then I, I boiled it down. So I had Ada, Eddie and Tito and a little bit of Chatterjee. And they were the ones that really interested me. So the early stages of the book, I mean, I remember beginning by writing around a photograph I had of a young woman at a an oil derrick in South Trinidad, and that was Ada's voice. So she came very early on, then I built these other ones in. I think the novel was probably almost ready to go out two years, two years ago. You know, it was, it was ready to go out. And we had, I say we, my agent and I, we had a, a lot of you know, kicking back from publishers who were, you know, in England now, it's difficult if you're, if your earlier work, if you've had sales that haven't been rocketing, then it's quite dif difficult to get yourself a deal for your third book. I mean, it's just hard. And um, what, you know, it wasn't a particularly fashionable subject. There were lots of things kind of going against the book. And it was Jeremy, when I sent it to Jeremy, he was really encouraging. But one of the things he said was that it wasn't a particularly, although it was a Caribbean book, there were layers of that needed working through that pointed to a more specific time in history. So I'd been quite vague, you know, about when it was and what it was like politically, what was happening. I hadn't really developed my Chatterjee character particularly because I was I was kind of one, worrying about getting him right. I'm always wary of getting dialect right. Um, I'm quite careful about that. So when I talked to Jeremy, he said, um, "Can you hear that feedback on my? You can't hear it, Era. 
that slight no, no. feedback through. I'm getting like a Siri thing that's coming through my watch on my phone that's saying I can't understand. So if you can't hear it, it's fine. I'll just ignore. Okay. I'll just ignore it. Um, so Jeremy encouraged me to really go through the whole thing and start being much more specific about these different things, you know. And I and I went to work on on looking, you know, at the water riots, looking at, you know, the the things that were happening at the time that I'd sort of been a bit too relaxed about. Um, and I think it gave it a lot more definition. Um, it strengthened it. It, you know, by by also working on the Chatterjee character. You know, I came to love Chatterjee. He was a, he was a smaller character in earlier drafts. But I'd been so nervous about getting him right. Um, and Jer through Jeremy, I kind of got more confidence and we worked together a bit on that. So it added another layer. And I'm really glad I did it, made it a much more Trinidadian book. And um, I, yeah, I hope that, I hope that um, answers the question. It does. And, and I think um, for those people who joined a little bit later, your earlier reading was such a treat. So I was hoping that you could treat us to a little bit, a, another snippet of okay. the reading of Fortune. Okay, this will be a, a short piece. Um, okay, so this is um, about halfway through the novel when Eddie and his workmen finally hit oil. So just as Eddie said, and how Flora saw it in her dream. Oil soon arrived. Three weeks of drilling and Eddie heard Callahan shouting, saw the rush of men to the derrick floor and figured something must be wrong. A deep groan from below ground. And as he ran along the ridge and up the steps to the platform, the earth started to shake. Next came a fizzy hissing sound. Eddie was up there at the mouth of the hole in time to feel the loud pop like a ball from a cannon and see a burst of black liquid shoot some hundred feet high beyond the crown and into the blue sky. His men ran for cover, fleeing, fleeing up the bank to the safety of the steam room. Then they started yelping, ran down the bank again, jumped up in the air, throwing off their hats and letting the fountain fall back onto their upturned faces and splatter like black rain, a dispensation from God onto their skin, in their hair, over their clothes, Eddie took off his hat too, and he let the oil pour down on him. He rubbed it into his face, into his scalp. He felt it splatter on his chest. Tripe, Long, Horatio were staring up at the column of oil. On the bank, Grace held on to Mercy. Mercy's hands were up in her face. She was yelping, look it come, it come. Eddie shouted, call Chatterjee, call him. Horatio started for the house, but Chatterjee was suddenly there. Eddie took his arm and raised it above his head. Sonny, what did I tell you? What did we tell you? Then he yelled into the air. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Fetch your wife, Eddie said to Chatterjee. She should see this. It doesn't happen every day. Do you hear what I'm saying? But she was already on her way, running down the hill with their boys. Come, get up here. Eddie looked around at the black dripping men, the tower of oil, the derrick floor washed with it. He wanted to hold it in his mind like a photograph along the fence. He saw McLeod's men standing and watching. When a well came in, it was good manners, manners to cheer or clap, even if the well belonged to somebody else. McLeod was there too. Eddie could see the outline of his hat. Meanwhile, the oil gushed. From above, Callahan shouted down to him to close the well off. They had run the drill pipe in too far. If we hit a spark, the whole thing goes. Eddie called for timbers and clamps and he sent Malachi to fetch them. Get the iron stacked up at the house. Mr. Long and Jellizo carried them. They fastened them onto the derrick while oil rained down. Check the pump, Horatio. We need to siphon it off. The oil sprayed hard like it came out of a giant hose, thick, blasting in their faces. Eddie was coated in the stuff. It was in his mouth, his ears. He strapped on goggles sealed them onto his eyes with tape. He put on a slicker hat and a cape. Then he straddled the pipe with a hacksaw and worked at it. Callahan stayed close, faces clothed, 
sorry, clothes and faces black with oil. At one point, Eddie looked up at them both and laughed. Who is who, he yelled. On the bank, Chatterjee stood with his wife and their sons. Sita had her arms around the boys, one on each side. Her eyes were fastened on the workings of the derrick. Eddie waved at her and she nodded at him. He cut the pipe in two. It sprung apart, enough so that together they could pull it off. Callahan and Metty held on to each side and wrenched the valves free. Metty pitched it down to the ground. Then Eddie dressed the threads all round. See, Callie, this isn't so bad. There were two hours of managing the fizzing pressure on the blowout preventer. What did I tell you? See how this will save us? They fixed the stuffing box on the casing connections and they worked at it and worked at it. And Grace bought chickens and stew and rice and laid out the plates on the wooden fold up table and they took turns to eat, never leaving the well unattended. And when the sun was gone, they switched on the generator Eddie had found in a heap. It was temperamental, but tonight it worked and he was grateful that they were able to see what they were doing. Let there be light, Eddie said, and he put his hands out to the sky. He felt alive. He'd seen enough wells come in and he knew what to expect, but this had been early, much earlier than expected at 600 feet. They were still bringing in the well in the early hours and it flowed easily into the newly constructed wooden tanks. The sound of the flow was sweet to his ears and Eddie felt certain they had hit something big. Callahan, Metty, Eddie, Jelizo, Horatio, Long and Malachi, they put their arms around each other and made a circle. They were exhausted, giddy as drunks. Eddie showed the men how to control the flow of oil. It was strong and it seemed to Eddie they were lucky. Remember this, this is the beginning. Don't forget it. You made this happen, we made this happen. He walked up to the house in the dark, sticky with oil, his hair full of it, his hair streaked like he crawled out of a, a swamp. Chatterjee let him inside the house use the telephone. Tito's voice was thick with sleep. Did we strike big? Is this how you say it? Strike big? Was it a gusher? Tell me, tell me. Ada is awake now. She's desperate to know. I'm desperate to know. Eddie laughed. I can't tell yet, but it looks good. It looks very good. It'll pay. I'm pretty sure of that. This well will pay. In fact, I'd put my life on it. Eddie realised his eyes were blurred with tears. It wasn't joy so much as relief. His instincts were right. Thank God, Tito said. We'll throw a party. Wow. <laughs> that was such an evocative scene. I mean, I literally saw it happen in front of me. Um, and it really speaks to your strength as a writer, Amanda. You're both spare and yet you're extremely evocative. Um, but I'm going to take us out of that slightly magical spell that you put us on and put us on to a more fun segment, a fun segment. So okay. um, I hope that you're ready for it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know that uh, sometimes we can pull some surprises on one another as, as writers and friends. But here, here we go, if you're ready. Um, you step onto an elevator, right? Mm -hmm. Where the publisher and editor of your dreams are in conversation about a very specific topic. It's up to you to pitch them your dream project for that topic, be it a book, a play, sculpture, musical, album, anything creative your heart desires. Um, now, each prompt is specially tailored to guest writers, according, as Shivani has told me. And your prompt is, I hope you're ready, it's a Trinidadian classic, your can't play mass and frayed powder. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness and, and it's actually okay. chosen for you um you know for you because of the spirit of daring and pioneering that yeah. runs through yeah. fortune and the way the characters attempt to shape their own destinies despite overwhelming odds so go for it okay so i'm going to pitch the idea of a movie of fortune so i would like um uh, uh, not a TV series, but an actual movie. And I would like Jane Campion is directing, starring ha Hayley Atwell as Ada, uh, Xavier Bardem as Tito. And I'm a little unsure about Eddie, but I think um, I'd like a sort of James McAvoy maybe. So not overly handsome, but kind of lots of energy. Um, I would like 
Nicholas Brittel, Brittel to do the soundtrack. So he wrote the soundtrack for Moonlight and Succession. If you've seen Succession, he's brilliant. And I'm thinking, although I'd like, I, although it's set in the 1920s, I'd like some of the soundtrack to be contemporary, like really contemporary, so that it goes against that um, sort of roaring 20s thing. Um, so yeah, I'd like that to be a kind of epic, there will be blood kind of movie. And yeah, go and see that your local everyman cinema. <laughs> Wow. Well, you know, I'm glad you dreamt big. And this is this sounds like something that I could actually happen because I told you from the first time I read your first draft that this is absolutely cinematic. But now, what about the part about your care, play, mass and frayed powder? I'm not letting you get away with that. Well, what do I have to say? I don't understand. What do I okay, do you mean? Well, basically, it's like, how would you how would you say that? Um, you know, when you take enormous risks, you yeah. can't be somebody who is going to be afraid of the consequences. Yeah. And do you yeah, think yeah, yeah, yeah. that some of your characters are like those kinds of very strong and creative yeah. and also slightly reckless people? Do you think that one has to be almost reckless to make it uh, big in life? You know, like that Roman saying, you know, fortune favors the brave. Uh, yeah. Do you think yeah. that that applies to your characters? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's that is the whole thing about overreaching, isn't it? Yes. About not being content. You know, is it is it failure if you if it, is it accept if you accept what you have is that a form of failure? And should we be always reaching? Should we always go for the apple at the top of the tree? You know, or should we should we know and we have it good and we hold on to that? Because in the end, you know, Eddie took them out, you know, by overreaching, and they were all colluding with him. And in the real life story, look what happened. You know, lots of lives were lost. So, and, yeah. So, so in a sense, it is about taking huge risks. And I guess, it is. you know, with huge risk yeah. comes huge gain and possibly yeah. devastation of everything. It's a gamble. It's, yeah. It's a huge gamble. It's a huge and, gamble. And Amanda, I'd love to keep speaking to you about this for the rest of the afternoon. Because honestly, I when I read Fortune, I thought I'd just have a little read before I go to bed. And I literally, I looked at the clock and I, it was 4 a.m. And I just felt like I had to finish it because it was so compelling at so many different levels and as layered and as complex as the comp as our society itself. So congratulations. It's going to fly. It's going to be that movie. And, uh, you know, with, with the big names. And I hope that you don't forget our your old friends here, okay, when you're having a red carpet <laughs> event. <laughs> You'll so, be right there. Thanks, thank Sarah. You, thank you so but much. I, but I want to congratulate you on this amazing feat, a uh, real, uh, you know, uh, what, what you did was a labor of love. It, you can tell in everything you did, it was meticulous and yet creative. So, you know, um, thank you for giving Trinidad that. And I hope it flies in every way that you wanted to. And I suppose that brings us to the end of our conversation. But I also, before I go, I uh, want to thank Shivani and Bokus and, uh, you know, the NGC Lit Fest for asking me to um, come on and, you know, step into Shivani's shoes, which I was extremely nervous about because she's so brilliant at drawing people out. I mean, who follows, a, you know, a somebody who was nominated for the Forward Prize in poetry and uh, tries to fumble through? However, Shivani, thank you so much for having me here and it's been a pleasure thank you and i believe shivani thank you. will be back <laughs> thank you thank Amanda. you thank you both that brings us astonishingly a little sadly to the end of season six of bios and bookmarks thank you all for keeping us company across the span of these six episodes ones that have explored our relationship as caribbean readers writers, thinkers, and dreamers with the environment around us, both, as you will have heard from Amanda's riveting reading, the environment of our past, as well as the environment of our present, and hopefully a sustainable ecology for the future. Bios and Bookmarks is made possible 
through the extraordinary ongoing support of the NGC Bocas Litfest. Without the National Gas Company, this program and many others like it that we run would not be possible. And so I truly hope you will consider becoming a friend of Bocas Litfest to support our ongoing projects, see what we'll do for the next decade ahead of us, and join us in the very front row seat of that conversation. I want to thank all of this season's guests, Barbara Lala, Jason Allen Paisan, Anna Portnoy Brimmer, Zakia McKenzie, Miriam J. A. Chancy, and Amanda Smith. To this season's formidable guest hosts, Nicholas Lachlan, Andre Bagu, Akila White, and of course, Ira Mathru. To the publishers of this season's books, Yui Press, Carcanet, Yes Yes Books, and La Impresora, Rough Trade Books, and People Tree Press. If you missed any of the episodes, don't worry. You can view them for a limited time on our Facebook page. Very special thanks to Bios and Bookmarks technical producer, Stefan Ramprasad, who has been my right-hand man throughout this process, and the Seijin Seasons production consultants, Georgia Popplewell and Cedric Smart. Bios and Bookmarks will return in 2022. To all of you viewing in the Caribbean and around the world, please stay safe, take care of each other, take care of our environment, and I'll see you soon.